when I'm putting together any kind of a painting is what can I leave out? How can I eliminate some lines? How can I eliminate some edges and really play up the strength and the, the drama of negative shape painting? So um, today what I'm going to do is kind of break this down into maybe six segments. I, I emailed this to Lois so she's aware of it as well. Uh, but what I, I intend to do is do my sky first and then bring a little bit of that down into the timberline, below the timberline of the mountains so that we have a little bit of a wash that will start to define the, the upper third of the painting. Uh, then I'm going to um, drop in my shadow sides of my building so that I really can define where the light source is coming from. And it's going to be coming from the upper left aim down towards the lower right so that you have a real strong sense of where the light is coming from. Then we'll, uh, I'll do a, a light wash beneath my trestles. And then the fourth segment will be doing my foregrounds, mainly over in the lower right. And then the fifth section will be uh, cutting in around the trestle structure and doing some blending and softening and doing my railroad tracks. And then the final section segment is just to do your detail trim with rigor, a rigor brush. Uh, just to put some of the little accents in. So that, that's how this whole painting will unfold. And so now what I'm going to do is start with a flat brush. I have this one inch flat that I use. I'm going to get it pretty wet and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring my, my camera over here to show you the palette. Excuse me, aren't, aren't we going to do any uh, sketching first or we're going to go straight to painting? Well, I was hoping everybody would have their sketch done so that you're ready to start painting right away. What I wanna do is, is start dr dropping in my sky and I have uh, some white snow-capped mountains. So I'm gonna bring my sky down to the top of those mountains and I'm gonna mix up some, some cobalt blue and I'll probably put a little bit of uh, yellow okra into this once I start to give myself some variation and from cool to warm within my sky. But what I'm going to do here is just basically start working in with a very light uh, bit of wet coming down around these uh, the mountaintops. And then I'll pick up a little bit more intense blue and drop a little bit of that in there where it's wet. And just keep working down. And I have my board at a slight angle so that there's some gravity pulling some of this water down towards the bottom of the page. And that helps uh, smooth out any brush strokes. But I'm just gonna work my way around these, these little forms uh, that I've already got sketched in here. And as I, you can see, the, the water creates a bead up against the dry edge of the paper where it comes down to my mountaintops. And that uh, allows the, the uh, pigment to get a little darker right up against the white of the, the mountains and uh, accentuate where there's a bit of a value contrast. Now I'm gonna introduce just a little bit of, of uh, warm yellow okra to this. And I use yellow okra or raw sienna, either one, because it works nicely, with, it plays nice with the, uh, the cobalt blue. And I'm, I'm just gonna drop some water into part of this guy so some of it stays a little lighter. And we got some, some nice darks dropping in across the mountain. Go back and drop a little bit of cool into the, uh, the upper right corner of my sky. And just now I'm going to clean my brush, kind of wipe most of the water off of my brush. And I'm going to wick up and drag part of this right down across the mountains. So I, dr I drag some of my sky into the, the area of the mountain, leaving just a little bit of white on the tops. I'm going to go back over to the other side now, and I want to pick up just a little uh, more intense blue, not very wet, but just a little bit of ultramarine mixed in with this mixture with some uh, yellow okra. And I'm going to just drop in a little bit of, of uh, darker value, just slightly darker in value than the sky, with, and with just a little bit of warmth added to it with some yellow okra or raw umber, and that is going to allow me to have just a slightly warmer, darker value to cut in kind of beneath the snow fields at the, at the mountain caps. Uh, and then I'll just take a damp brush and soften the top edges 
of the uh, of the snow where it blends into the uh, the color. And you can see when you just take a, and squeeze a little bit of that water off the end of your brush, and you can just soften that so you get a nice transition from the pure white of the paper to this very soft value. And in some places, like right in here, I'm going to eliminate any edges all together and just bring them that sky right down into the the uh, uh, middle ground of the mountain. The paper dry, um, Randy. Yes, this paper is dry. I started the sky dry. I had enough water on my brush that it was able to uh, to work with it. And I'm just now using a damp brush to more or less just soften all of the uh, the brush strokes. We're going to let that dry now. And I want you to uh, take this opportunity to go ahead and just sort of lay in your own bits of value up against these buildings. Don't forget to go in between some of these little smokestacks. Can you remind us what the pigment is in the warm, darker area, please? Uh, what I'm using is a combination of cobalt and a little touch of raw umber. It gives it a little earthier color. It still stays cool, but it's, it's not quite as... Uh, brilliant or as transparent as what we see in the sky. And that way you've got just a sense of this uh, land is a little closer to us than what's off in the sky, simply because we've added that warmth to it. Now I've got some middle ground trees that are going to be painted over the top of this, but if you stop above the trees, it'll look like those trees are pasted on. So I just go ahead and paint right through my middle ground, bringing this, this far distant uh, wash right over everything. And you can see it's, it's starting to, to block out the shape of my buildings. I'm gonna come back in here with a little bit Randy, of is there any way of showing your palette at the same time as the painting or does that make the painting too small? No, nope. because... it's a little bit difficult because I, my camera is on an articulating arm oh, and I can only go up so high, but I will go back and forth and show okay. you okay, sure. the mixtures that I'm making. Okay. Um, see if we can get that centered. And I'm just going to bring in and drop in around these trestles here in the, the uh, up against the buildings, just so we get a little bit of value in here to, to block out these shapes. And I'm, I'm going to stop at this point and let this uh, just wick up some of this excess bead of water that's coming down towards the bottom and just let this dry while you guys paint and, and work on this. So I'm going to also lift a little bit of the, uh, the take a tissue or something and, and lift a little bit of the white from the snow caps. They've got a little bit of, of water and pigment in them. So they're slightly uh, tinted as opposed to the whites that are over on the left side, which are closer to the viewer. So that there's a little more intensity over there. Randy, just, can you, someone's just yeah. said that they're, they're feeling a little bit lost. Could you just recap quickly what you've done right from the beginning, please? Absolutely. What we start with is just some cobalt wash. It's mostly water, a little bit of cobalt. And I just dropped it in with a flat brush. Let me wipe this off. Uh, using this brush. And I just kind of walked, came down to the tops of the mountains. I want to come back in and maybe add just a touch of darker value blue in a couple of spots over here on the left side to accentuate the value contrast between the snow-capped mountains and the building, which is going to be a negative shape as well. And now you can start to see that we've got a darker value on the left. And as the sky moves farther away from us over to the right, everything gets lighter in value. And I've got just a little bit of, of yellow okra mixed in to the sky in here, which warms it up, which takes us from a cool to a warm a darker value to a lighter value, all of those things work uh, to help us create the perception of perspective and uh, uh, diminishing uh, uh, distance is what I'm trying to say. So um, I wanna give you an opportunity to really get your sky in there right. And, and the purpose of this is to help you just basically start blocking out some of these uh, these really kind of loose shapes in the background to define where your building is going to be. And I'm just want to get a little value above some of these smokestacks here so that we've got just a, a touch of white cap snow 
on the mountaintops. And now that this is starting to dry a little bit, I can come back in and drop in just a little bit more value. And you can start to see how it really kind of makes those mountains more uh, dominant. You can really start to see them. But the other, the other side of the coin is we can't get this too wet because we've got to come back in and start working on uh, the shadow sides of the buildings next. I'm gonna get a little bit of uh, water Sometimes if you just take a, a clean brush like this with a little bit of water on it and just flick it onto your uh, a wash, you can loosen things up a little bit and it'll just create a little extra texture, which is always kind of an interesting uh, element to add to a painting, but you've got to still see the shine. And I think most of you can see this, there's a light on this and I'm hoping that you can see that the, how wet that surface still is. It, uh, it's important to be able to work with plenty of water because if you don't, your, uh, your paint is gonna dry too fast and you're gonna have oh. a real uh, kind of opaque look to it. You wanna have that fluid watery uh, surface to allow the pigment to flow across the surface of the paper. So um, what I'd like to do next, if everybody is, uh, about ready. And one of the things I'm going to do at some point is once this sky dries a little bit, you can, I pressed pretty hard so you could see the, the sketch on here, but it left a pencil line where I really want to have some delicate white snow, snow peaks. I can take a kneaded eraser and erase that when the paint's dry. But uh, if I paint over it, I'm locking in those pencil lines and they may be a little distracting. So any little secret is if you inadvertently paint over a pencil line that you want to eliminate for some reason, go back in and add a little darker value up over the top of it and you won't even see that pencil line. So it, it just helps to uh, control your, um, the line drawing versus the painterliness of, of your composition. Um, so if everybody is uh, ready, I'm gonna go on to the next step. And I'm gonna do a, a, a series of colors here with these buildings. But um, what I tell people initially, when you're starting a painting, you wanna get about a quarter of the way or a third of the way done uh, by dropping in these light values to block out your basic shapes, which we've just done. At that point, you want to put some of your true darks in, because if you don't put your, your really true, true darks in, you don't have a reference of the lightest lights to the darkest darks. And consequently, if you don't do this, you will end up painting mid-tone after mid-tone after mid-tone, and pretty soon at the end of the painting, you'll go, why does my painting look weak? Why does it not have any pop to it or drama? It's because it looked dark while you were painting these midtones, but it was you didn't really see the full range as you step back away from your painting at any step during the process of painting. So you always want to come back into a painting about 25% a, a of the way in and allow yourself to drop in around your center of interest some of your darkest darks. You don't have to do the whole painting, you know, all the darks that are going to be everywhere. But in a couple of spots, it's imperative that you get a few of those really good, strong darks into your painting. Now, I'm going to uh, play up a little bit of the, the one shadow side of this building and just introduce a little bit of uh, maybe phthalo blue right up in this, this corner here of this building. And I want to also use a little bit of orange. While that's wet, I'm just going to drop a little bit of orange into the back side of this building. And now I've all of a sudden gotten a very exaggerated sense of the glow that happens within a shadow. I'm going to follow this up with a little bit of raw sienna or yellow ochre down here in the bottom of this side of the building. And then just drop a little water into this whole side and let that water carry the pigments through the entire shape so that they flow back and forth and they just start blending on their own. And if you allow the pigment to just start blending on its own, I'm gonna take these rolls of tape out and let that painting lay flat. 
and just let the water move my pigments around, that's where you will get a really nice glow because you're not mashing this all up with your brush. You're not overworking it. You're letting the water move the pigments around. And that's the key to the whole thing in getting these really luminous glows of paint. I'm gonna bring this shadow right up the side underneath the eave and then add a little bit of orange coming down this other side. And we'll just let that, again, let that flow with the rest of the, uh, the, the water that's on here. I'm gonna put just a little dark, darker value right up in there. And that's just very wet bead of paint that's sitting there. What's the color blue you, you're using, please? I used a little bit of phthalo blue because it has a turquoise -y, uh, kind of cast to it. And I think that works nicely with the orange that I laid in towards the back. I'm gonna drop in just a little bit more orange so you can start to see the drama of that color next to the phthalo blue. I'm just very softly kind of allowing the, the water to kind of mingle and mix. Let some of this flow back and forth on that surface. And uh, I think you'll get a really nice um, result. And then we'll do the same thing. I'm gonna add a little bit more green maybe uh, or turquoise down on the next one, just so we can get some variety of color. Excuse going. me, Randy. Yes. Go ahead, question. Did you, um, on the, the building that you've just done with the orange and blue, did you, did you paint the whole thing blue and then drop the orange in? No, I just put a little bit of blue, very wet, right up in this corner. And then I cleaned my brush. Uh -huh. and I got a little bit of orange and I put it very wet over in the opposite corner. And then I clean my brush again and I put a little bit of raw sienna down in this lower right corner. And then I clean my brush again and I just added a little water in the lower left corner. And now the result was I had a kind of a trapezoidal square shape that had a big puddle of water on the surface of the paper. And I tipped my board a little bit and I let these colors just run together and play nice together. And what happens is all the pigments flow back and forth within that puddle and they begin to settle down into the tooth of the paper. And when they settle down into the tooth of the paper, the water starts to evaporate and soak into the paper. And you get a result of all these individual pure pigments that are mingling and mixing together. Um, so you, uh, you basically have them start giving sort of a, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a uh, vibration of color that creates that luminous glow. And so that's, that's great. Thank you. See, whoops, I had a little too much blue on that. I want to, didn't clean my brush. So you, when that happens, just go back. Randy, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. What color, how are you mixing the green that you're doing now, please? Oh, I just picked up a little bit of, uh, Viridian and some uh, ultramarine. Okay. And I just dropped a little bit of this over on this side of the building. I go right across the doors. I don't even bother worry, worrying about doorways, uh, but I am leaving a negative shape for these little support struts that are uh, sticking out from the surface. I want to also pick up a little bit of the orange and get it down here on the lower right. And then I'm going to take clean water and just drag it across this and then maybe add a little bit of, of the uh, cooler blue, which is the, uh, I'm using, I've got a, here's, here's what it's looking like. I've just got a kind of a sloppy little mix of ultramarine and a touch of the uh, Viridian and you get sort of a neutralized blue. I bring it over here. I'll zoom in real close so you can see this. And I just drop in a little puddle in places, clean my brush, just put, swish all the water on, on the brush and just add water to the surface of this building. I'm gonna add a little bit of the blue to the orange. It's gonna make gray, but it's, uh, it's a lively gray. And I'm leaving some of this orange just uh, isolated by itself, not trying to mix anything with it. So it stays nice and warm and has, has a, an interesting pop to it. Drop a little bit more orange into a couple of these spots. But you can see, I'm going to zoom back out now. Um, 
we've got little pops of color all through this side of the building. I'm gonna kind of roll my board around a little bit and let these colors kind of do their own thing and settle down by themselves so we get a nice mixture. I'm gonna add just a touch of orange down in the bottom part of this building to, re to suggest a little bit more reflected light. I'll take uh, a just, I'm just gonna pick up a, a tint of some dirty water here with some blue in it and just drag this down across the side of all these timbers that are beneath the, uh, the chute that's coming down. And I'll add a little bit of uh, yellow okra down in here just to give some warmth to it. It doesn't look like much at this point, but it will give it the, the warmth that it needs when we start putting the other darker colors around it. This is all very, very light. This is about a number three on a value scale uh, in value. It's not, not real dark because we're gonna come in on either side of this once this dries with some really nice darks to really define this building a little better. Um, I think at this point, I wanna let you uh, get to this, this stage and then we'll, we'll talk about putting some uh, some middle ground around these buildings that will really define them. So anybody have any questions at this point? I'm gonna let you paint and then we'll just, I'm gonna continue working with a little bit of uh, value up against this. Excuse me, Randy, could you just go over the colors again, the pigments on the building? This is where you wanna get creative. I Think about colors that play nice together uh, I'm using a, a little bit of cobalt blue and a little bit of Viridian green up in this corner. That's a nice cool uh, rendition. But then as I move laterally across the surface of this building, I start introducing oranges and I start introducing yellow okra to, to create the impression of a lot of uh, bounced reflected light. And I'm gonna get a little bit of a shadow underneath this chute when we're done with it, but I'm not, I'm not at that stage yet. I also, at this same stage, I'm gonna take a little bit of this green and bring it across and let it join uh, under the eave. And I wanna also introduce a little bit more orange coming down the side here and some cobalt blue. And I'm just going to drop in the shadow that's coming down the side of that building. And we'll just let that kind of die away there. I'm gonna add just a touch of darker uh, ultramarine right in here along the edge of that. Take my brush tip and just kind of with a little bit of water, smooth that out. So we have a nice contrast between the, the negative shaped sides of the building that are facing the light and the parts of the building that are in shadow. And these shadows are not real dark shadows. They're just, uh, they've got a lot of transparency to them. And the way we suggest that transparency is by getting some warmer colors on the back side of the shadow and some cooler colors right near the, where it's cast. Um, I am always checking the back of, with the back of my fingers to see if the surrounding middle ground is dry yet. It's still uh, a little damp but I'm gonna come back in with my flat, this brush here, and I'm gonna get uh, a really rich dark mix of some, a combination of maybe some sap green and some indrathene or Prussian blue, whatever you've got in the way of a really nice dark blue. I'm gonna move my camera now over to my palette and show you that I'm, I'm gonna go into my Prussian blue and it's pretty rich and deep and dark. I'm going to pick up a little bit of a warm green. This is a sap green. And you mix them together and you've got a really nice kind of uh, winter forest green color. I'm going to bring my camera back. And what I'm going to work on is a bunch of trees that are over here along the, uh, the middle ground. That, And I'm not trying to paint individual trees. I'm just painting an overall shape of trees that come in behind these buildings and define them. And as we get closer to the ground, I'm gonna pick up just a little bit of, of raw umber and mix that in with this color 
So we go from a very cool, dark, uh, bluish tint at the top of these trees, and we start moving downward, and that actually is coming closer to the viewer with this raw umber, and we can define the shape underneath the trestle, and we just kind of occasionally drop a little bit of that deeper blue in there. It doesn't have to be a perfect uh, shape. You're just trying to get a variety of warms and cools in there that really kind of uh, set the tone for a nice, rich, dark background. We're going to do the same thing over on the other side, but not quite as, as dark. So I'll add just a little bit more water to this, a little bit more uh, raw umber. And by just adding a little bit more water, it, it gives you less value, less uh, intensity. And I'm just going to move my, my way across this shape. And these are just trees off in the distance. So I'm just going to give a few little ticks of uh, upsweep with my brush just to suggest where the tops of those trees are without really giving it a whole lot of definition. I'm going to come back in and work around the supports that are supporting the, the uh, what do you call it, the trestle. And I'm going to add a little bit more raw umber. And you can see when you drop in, I don't know if you can see this in the camera, hopefully you can, there's just enough warmth in raw umber that it changes the complexion of that, that dark that we're dropping in. And I'm going to just keep adding a little bit more of this. I'll take a small brush just drop some water in there. Make sure that the water is moving this stuff around. I want to get enough dark over the top of this chimney so that we can actually see that chimney. And we're, all, we're, all I'm doing is just adding a little bit of uh, value there to define it. And uh, I want to take and soften the back edge of these trees so they just kind of disappear. I'm going to add a, just a touch of, of raw of cerulean blue to just push it into the distance. But I'm just kind of squirreling my brush around across the tops of these trees to give them a softer edge where they just kind of start to blend into the background. And you don't really see where the, the trees in the middle ground end and the mountains behind them begin. You just want to give it a nice soft transition. And then underneath the trestle, I want to just, just soften these strokes so they come down into some shadow shapes which will be darker later. And I just, and all I'm trying to do is soften this so it doesn't have a real strong edge to it. It's just a tone that we're laying in here. Um, do you want to, could you zoom out please so that we yep. can see the whole, that's great, marvelous. And maybe take a pause like, while people just sort of. Light down a little bit so that we can maybe see uh, less glare and more color. Uh, I'm going to add just a touch of uh, darker value now. I am actually picking up the same colors I used before, but drier, less water. I'm picking up some raw umber and some of this uh, Prussian blue. And I'm going to come back and into this area that's still kind of damp. I'm going to drop in some darker tree shapes. And they don't have to be really detailed. They're just sort of a, an implied shape that suggests a tree, but it creates a little bit more um, intensity within that shape. It's all the same color. I'm just gonna drop some water in there, just some sprinkle a little bit of water and let it, it sort of uh, bloom a little bit. We'll get some darks underneath this to create a stronger contrast under the railroad trestle clean my brush and just push this right up to the edge of that building that we can see beyond the, uh, the train trestle. Uh, I'm going to come back in and we'll do some, some uh, washes beneath this trestle in a moment. But right now, I just wanted to get these darks in up against my buildings. And this is what I was talking about when I said earlier that we want to get some really true darks in here just to establish some value that's really critical to the overall um, composition in the value scale. Randy, what color are you putting down on uh, the, because I'm miles behind the you. Blue, 
It's a combination of Prussian blue and a little bit of raw umber. The raw umber gives it an earthiness. Uh, the, the blue is pretty dark and, and cold, but when you add a little bit of raw umber to it, you really get a nice uh, mixture of, of and variety. It doesn't feel like too intense in one, you know, one temperature. It's got sort of that middle ground look that we're after. I'm going to uh, Thank you. clean my brush, see if I can just sprinkle a little bit, soften some of this. And a lot of times, if you just drop water into a, a damp area, it will create texture by itself. And you don't have to put a lot of detail into it. That the texture that you get from water repelling the paint, just pure water. And this has just got pure water on them. Just drop a little bit of water here in a couple spots. And we'll just have to give it time and be patient and see what happens. Cause you can never know exactly what you're gonna get in the way of these, these little blooms, but they create, uh, they literally repel the, the deeper, darker pigment. And you get some, uh, some pretty amazing little textural effects. Is there a, a paint you can use instead of Russian, Russian blue? I'm sorry, what was the question? Somebody wants to know what they can use instead of Prussian blue. Oh, Indrathene, or you can just mix uh, a little bit of the uh, ultramarine with the uh, raw umber. That might get it. Um, anything that's going to get you dark, uh, darker than just a, a pure blue. But you can see how, how dramatic that contrast is, having those darks. It makes the buildings come forward. People, you know, worry and they're afraid of darks, but the reality is nobody pays attention to the darks. It's the negative shapes that come forward that we recognize and see. So to make part of your painting more dramatic and more um, recognizable, put some darks on either side or behind or around a negative shape and it will jump off the page at you and it will be very, very dramatic. So while we're waiting for that to, uh, to dry, uh, first of all, I, I, I want to give everybody a chance to catch up because I don't, I don't want you to get left behind here. Uh, you can see that a lot of the edges are disappearing over here. They're just getting very soft. Whereas this edge of the treetops of this bunch of forests back here are uh, pretty well defined. But if just to recap a little bit, I brought some of the sky down beneath the white snow caps and painted right through this middle ground earlier. And now you can see the transition between this really dark and the white of the snow caps has some, some little bit of reflection of the sky on the sides of these mountains, which softens that transition and makes it a little nicer. I missed uh, some darks right in here. So while we're talking, I'm just gonna go back in and add a few more of that uh, from my palette using that same color that I've got mixed. I'm gonna push that right up into between these smokestacks. And then I've got just a little tick of one there. That helps, uh, helps us see everything pretty clearly now. All right, so now you've, you can really start to see these smokestacks. I put those in there just to give me some vertical rhythm within this arrangement or composition of buildings. Um, I may or may not paint all of the, the smokestack uh, I may rely more on the negative shapes and then where it's next to uh, got a kind of a light background behind it, I may put a darker value on it, but we want to have uh, a progression of negative shapes to positive shapes within some of these um, uh, vertical negative shapes. All right. Um, where are we going now? Let's see. Yeah, Let's... Just, I would have a little pause, have a drink of water. And okay. uh, just, just pause for a little bit longer, if you would, please. Well, uh, and if anybody has questions while you're painting, just unmute and ask them or put them on the chat so that uh, Lois can pass them along and everybody will benefit from hearing, you know, what those questions might be. I'm just touching up some of my edges here, make sure that I've got uh, everything kind of smoothed out. I don't want to get anything too, um, where's my Kleenex? pick up a little bit of some of these drops of uh, whatnot in here. We'll just throw some of that in there just to soften this a little bit. Okay. Um, 
not sure that was a long enough pause, but <laughs> no, no, we're we're gonna give people a chance. I'm gonna while we're waiting. Remember what I said about the uh, the sky and the mountaintops. I'm gonna use this opportunity now because my sky is dry. I'm gonna take a kneaded eraser and just come back in and erase some of the line work at the tops of some of these mountains. I always check to make sure it's dry before I do this. Um, but it just de-emphasizes those and it makes it just more of a suggested um, shape. I can take a small brush while we're waiting and uh, maybe dip it into just some, some very diluted cobalt and come in a little bit on the shadow side of a couple of these little peaks where there's a light background. This helps provide just a touch of definition of where some of these peaks are. And we just start to, to, you know, just put the shadow side of some of these mountains in and then soften the bottom edge of them where they just recede down the side of the slope. So you don't have just a real obvious brush stroke, but you start to see a few of these little um, shadowy areas within the mountain range against the lighter background. And it really helps provide an additional bit of definition and then in some places, I just erase everything so that we just don't see any real obvious um, peaks, but we, we just have a it, more of a sense of it, a feeling of it uh, without getting too defined. Just drop in a little bit more mid-tone or very light values back there. Over here on this side, where we have, uh, we're closer to the viewer, I'll give us just a touch of... Uh, darker blue than the sky coming down to it. Maybe add a little purple in there too, uh, just to, to bring this down like a ridge. And then maybe there's a little bit of white peeking out. And we just basically dilute this to nothing with just a clean brush of water. And you start to see a hint of, of uh, terrain on these mountaintops that feels like there's uh, they feel very natural that way. And you can come back in on the other side, maybe put a little bit of just a mark or two. Don't get too carried away because it, it'll give it too much, too obvious of an edge. But just a few of these marks is really all it takes. Let me get a little darker right in here. All right. Um, what do you think, Lois? Are we ready to go on to the next step? Could you just re revise, please, what the color of the trees was, the dark, dark bit? The darks that I used, I use a, uh, a Prussian blue and a little raw umber. The Prussian blue and the raw umber gives a really nice forest look to it, kind of the deep, deep darks against the snow. And uh, it really helps kind of create the contrast we're after without being too saturated or too, too much of a primary color. We want to neutralize it with that raw umber. And that's what helps get that, that uh, across. I'm going to take just a little bit more here. And this is still a little wet. So I'm just dropping in some, some very soft shapes back in here and then softening them with a clean brush just to suggest that there's a little bit of uh, something going on into the distance. A few of these trees are a little darker than the others around them. And we'll just soften that. So that, that gives you a nice transition from left to right going behind these buildings. Question? I thought I heard somebody talking. Mountain peaks, what color do you have? Can you hear that, Lois? The mountain peaks. Uh, what color do I have in the mountain peaks? Yeah. I use a little bit of uh, cobalt. And then I touched it with just a touch of purple on the ones that were closer to us. Anything that's closer to the viewer is going to be a little warmer, as opposed to things that are off in the distance, which will be cooler. Cobalt is a cool blue, so you want to use a very diluted version of cobalt. Uh, down beneath the snow peaks, I used a very diluted cobalt, very wet, softened all my edges. So it just gives a sense of the undulations of the sides of these peaks coming down as the mountain comes closer to the viewer. And then at all this, if you remember, I painted right through where I put my dark trees. So it didn't look like the mountains were pasted above the trees. 
and uh, it really pays off over in here, over on the right side where the trees are very light in value and the far mountains are even lighter still. So hopefully that uh, helps with that understanding. I, I'm going to take care of this one remaining building structure. I'm gonna go back and kind of remind everybody what I used to get those shadow sides of the buildings. I'm gonna use a, a little bit smaller flat brush because I've got a smaller shape to work within. I'm gonna pick up some phthalo blue, which has got a lot of turquoise tint to it. Um, and I wanna drop that right up against the corner where the light can't bend around. And you notice I'm just leaving a big puddle of water there. I'm gonna clean my brush. I'm gonna get an, another bit of orange in here and let the, 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 the phthalo blue puddle kind of mingle and mix with that orange. I'll come back in and add a little bit of the, the phthalo blue right up against the edge of this as well. I wanna pick up some of that so it isn't too dark. And then as I come down beneath the trestle, we use the same colors, uh, just a little bit more of the, the phthalo blue. And then I'll add a little bit of raw or raw sienna or um, what do you call it, uh, yellow okra. And I'm just going to drop this in and let the phthalo blue, maybe a little bit of cobalt, all just kind of mingle and mix together so that we get a nice wet uh, mixture of pigment and paint. And I'm going to add a little bit of orange into that puddle to get some warmth in the backside of this building. Uh, the warmth is representative of of uh, what do you call it, bounce light. So we're gonna start to see all these colors sort of neutralizing and blending together and remaining fairly soft. I wanna get a little bit of maybe uh, a lighter green in here to just sort of soften the back side of this. I'm using a cadmium green light. And then I'm, I'm going to drag my brush kind of down across this surface so it looks like we've got a bit of a shadow cast across this building as well. But then I want to come right back into that pinch between them and drop in some water so we get it lighter in value. Uh, and then I'm just going to soften these brush strokes as they come down into the ground. But now you've got kind of a nice glowing uh, surface on this building. I add a little bit more green to this. And that's separate, that's a warm green compared to the very cool green behind it with the Prussian blue and the, and the burnt, um, the raw umber. So now, while that's still wet, I want to take a little bit of that phthalo blue that we used and come right up underneath the eaves and connect it to this wet shape that's on the back side of the building and come down the other side so that we can see the, 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 the eave is casting a little bit of the shadow. And that helps define that overhang. So we'll let that, uh, I'll let this dry while you're painting. And again, if anybody has questions, they can jump in. Um, but the painting is starting to take shape. I mean, it's, it's moves fairly quickly. The thing about watercolor is you, you do need to work quickly because you want the water to be sitting on the surface of the paper. That's what allows the pigment to flow and, and give you these glowing colors. If you let the water start to dry and it starts soaking into the paper and the pigment starts soaking into the paper, then all of a sudden when you go to add more, more pigment to it, it's gonna neutralize and gray out on you. You're gonna lose that luminosity. The, the trick to watercolor is you want a surface that has enough water on it that allows the pigments to flow across and among and, and mingle together. And then as they start settling down into the, the tooth of the paper, that's where you get that visual vibration of the different pigments occurring. If your pigment already settles in and you don't have enough water, what happens is the, the paper starts to dry, the paint starts to soak into the fiber or the cotton of the paper. And then when you add another color, all you're doing is like taking your, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my camera over to my palette. 
You see all the colors that are in my mixing area? If I take a little bit of a damp brush and I do this with my brush, let's get a bigger brush here. What's happening? They're all getting gray. They're just losing their, their luminosity. They're losing their vibrance. Uh, and that's called neutralizing. That's graying down. Some of us have uh, euphemistically call it muddy. How many of us have ever painted a muddy painting? And, not, and wondered why, why does our painting turn out to be so muddy? Well, it's because we let the, the, we didn't have enough water on our brush to allow the pigment to stay up on the surface of the paper without soaking in and then adding another color and letting these colors mix together within that shape. That's the key to really getting some, some glowing color. Now, the other thing that you need to be aware of Look at the side of this building. It's kind of wimpy. It doesn't seem to have much impact. Well, when I put the darkest dark in that doorway and I put some color on this chute, all of a sudden these wimpy little kind of pale orange glow on the side of this building is gonna come alive. And we have to be able to visualize that and understand that white paper with a mid-tone next to it doesn't do much. It's the darks that we put next to the, the very pale midtones that make those midtones pop. And let's face it, why do we paint? We paint to create really interesting images. We want to entertain the eye. We want to do something that's fun and, and vibrant. And um, I don't think anybody sets out to do a muddy painting. We, we all want to have pure glowing colors. And the, what you have to understand is how the water does the work for us. And if we don't let the water have access to our pigment and start moving things around, then uh, we end up getting these opaque, muddy, neutralized shapes. So with that said, I'm going to, uh, to dip my brush into some Prussian blue, a little bit of orange. Orange and blue makes a dark. Here, look how dark this is getting. This is really, really dark. And I'm gonna add just a little bit of neutral tint to that. I've got a really, really dark, dark here. And what I'm gonna do is zoom in on this doorway. I've got two doorways. I'm gonna put one in here nice and dark. I'm gonna get a smaller brush and just pop this in the, above this uh, support that's working diagonally across my doorway. Can you repeat what made the dark dark, please? Um, I'm using a little bit of Prussian blue and orange together and a little bit of neutral tint. But now I'm going to add just pure orange at the bottom of this doorway. Look how that creates the impression that maybe there's some light in that dark doorway that suggests there's something else going on in there. I don't know if you can see that with this camera. Some of these cameras are not that wonderful, but um, I want to try to drop enough orange in the bottom here so that it feels like we want to go in there and explore a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more Prussian blue up here at the top just to really get a contrast in darks. I'm going to do the same thing. You notice how I painted my shadow right across this doorway. I'm now going to come back in and paint right over that shadow and create a really strong dark to suggest that this is my open doorway. And I'm going to, again, put a little bit of orange, maybe even a little alizarin red, uh, alizarin crimson, down in here to create that pinkish glow that says there's something going on inside. We want to go explore. We want to, we're, we're intrigued by what's happening or what's suggested by going from this really, really dark to this lighter value that says, hmm, what's happening? Let's, uh, let's uh, go explore a little bit. And uh, you can see, I'm going to back up now a little bit. What happened to that building? All those kind of weak orange and blue and turquoise uh, watery shapes that were on the side of that building are now we're looking at that dark doorway, seeing a really strong building shape emerge. People all the time paint right through, uh, you know, they, they paint around doorways, they leave 
windows uh, white, like a, a like a postage stamp. I'm a big advocate of just coming back over the top of things with a, a brush stroke of dark and just create a suggestion of a few little window panes. You don't have to do much. And just those little darks on that negative shape make things just pop. And they don't have to be perfect. If you make them too perfect, it gets a little bit, I don't know, it just doesn't have the same effect. You wanna have a looseness to it that really makes it more interesting. I'm gonna swing over so you can see. I've just created a just a kind of a light wash out of cobalt. And that's basically all it's got in it. It's a little bit of cobalt. Might have a little bit of green in it from this other mixture. But it's it's a mid-tone. And I'm just shoveling some water into this to thin it down. It's a glaze. And we're just going to glaze across the top of this. I want to make sure things are pretty well dry here. I'm not going to paint over the whites of the buildings. I just want the, the underside of these uh, trestles to be a little bit cooled off because they are in shadow. And I'll just get capture a little bit of this, add more water, and then a clean brush, just soften this down along the edge of the track. So it's just very, almost to the white paper. And all I did was just knock down the overall value. We'll let that dry. And I'm going to also come in and catch some of these uh, trestles that are showing, uh, I, I guess they're railroad ties or whatever that support the tracks that come off that little chute. And uh, all I've done is just knock down some of the intense value that you're going to see. I'll drop a little bit of shadow underneath there. And I'm, while we're waiting for that to dry, I'll use that same glaze. And I'm going to put a little bit of that into the chute that's coming out of the side of this building. And I'm going to then pick up a little bit of raw sienna and warm up the other side of the chute that's in sunlight. So you have a little bit of a cool and a little bit of warm, very wet, right in that, that surface that's the chute. And then um, I'll probably come back and clean up the whites along this edge here. And I'll put some darks once this dries on the opposite side. But for now, it's just, just dropping in some very light tones. Uh, while I'm waiting for all that to happen, I can take a little bit of orange and I can drop in just a few little marks along the top edge of this shape that goes across the trestles just to define that upper side. And then I'm gonna push a little bit of water, uh, clean water on the edge of my brush up into that mark so that it bleeds towards the viewer and it still leaves a little bit of white on the, the lower or the leading edge closest to the viewer of the trestle. I have a question here. How do you clean up your whites? Ah, oh, good, good question. Later, uh, if you have one of these, this is what's called a, a magic eraser. It's a high density foam eraser. I cut a little piece of this off and I'll put a little water in it, squeeze all the water out. And then I'll mask off any particular shape that got painted over. Like I, I had some little sloppy marks that came across the edge of the chute. I can pop that right back to the white of the paper. It used to be years ago, you had to have a stiff brush and you had to kind of lift or scrub out the whites. And what happened is you started dissolving the cotton of the paper and it started balling up and, and dissolving and it made a mess. And with this one or two little gentle swipes with masking tape on either side and you create a crisp white of the paper. You go literally right back to the white of the paper. And in a couple of spots, if you wanna really pop up a few whites, it's a great way to do it. I use a, a, a masking tape. And what I do is I'll pull a little piece of it off and then I'll put it on my uh, pant leg and just to, to get a little bit of denim or shirt fabric, whatever I can touch it to, to, to pull up some of the uh, stickum and then I can literally lay it in and then I'll show you how to do that later. That'll be part of the trim at the very end of the painting when we use the rigger. All right, um, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna work on this area over here. I wanna let this dry. And this is a good thing to do when you're painting any painting is if you reach a point in your painting where you've got a wash that you put on or you've got some shapes that you wanna come back in and paint over the top, 
uh, you need to let that dry. And we're all pretty impulsive. We're all impatient. We want to keep painting. We don't like to stop. We don't like to, to pause. So a good you know, alternative is to go to someplace else in the painting. I'm going to go over here where my painting, my paper is totally dry, and we're going to work on this part of the painting and allow the opposite side of the painting to dry. Then I can come back and start working on that. Um, but it, it gives us an opportunity to kind of move around a little bit. And I want to get a really nice warm uh, color on the corner of this little uh, mansard roof here. And it's sort of an angled rooftop. I want to get uh, a little bit of orange up inside these little metal roof areas. And so I'm just going to drop in some wet shapes with orange paint. I'm going to add a little bit of gamboge, which is a little yellow. Uh, it's a warm yellow sort of an Indian yellow. And then I'm going to also drop in some water at the bottom edge of these marks to let them start to uh, soften and get less in value, less intense, so that they go from a dark to a light. Now, I'm also going to put up right up in the pinch here, a little bit of burnt sienna. And that burnt sienna is just kind of a darker, warmer version of the orange. And you can see how that makes it feel like it's coming right up into the joint of that fascia that goes vertically around the surface of this building. This is another building that's on this side of the tracks facing the opposite way. We don't really need to see a lot of detail, but I'm using it as a device to complete the composition, give us a little bit of something of value and interest to look at without it being the center of interest. And so I'm just kind of very vignetting this away a little bit with lighter and lighter uh, intensity. What I mean is we've got more water, less pigment, and it just gets, it fades away to almost nothing. Get just a little bit of burnt sienna and pop that right up into the joints where some of the battens are on this, uh, this roof to give a, each one of these negative shapes a little bit more definition and a little bit of dark value in there goes a long ways towards strengthening the perception that this is joining another structure vertically. Also, as I go behind this vertical fascia, I'm going to get really dark. I'm going to get some burnt, uh, burnt umber, a little bit of uh, lizard and crimson. So I've got a nice warm dark, but it's, it's really dark. And I can really make it feel like it, the surface drops down behind that fascia, clean my brush and just get more water going behind this chimney and just feather out this brush stroke with just pure water so that it just goes from a really nice dark to a very pale color. And I'm just, now we have a pretty nice little mark in there. I'm gonna clean my brush, get all the water off of it and just pull some of this color right up into the, uh, the fascia there behind this chimney. Maybe a little bit of warmth there, not much. And then I'm gonna also take a, a warmer version of that same lizard crimson burnt orange uh, and just pull it right across the back side of this chimney. And then again, let this get lighter as it comes down and let it just flow right into the roof of the building. So you, see, you just see a little bit of that dark coming up out of the roof. And we'll let that dry. I'll come back and put some shadows on the chimney. But for now, I've created kind of a nice little vignette that uh, encapsulates this building. And I'm also going to take some uh, Indian yellow and raw sienna, a little bit more of the warm yellow, and come in beneath this with a little bit of stucco or something, who knows what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm just gonna try to drop some warmth in here and, and drop a little bit of the same color that was on the rooftops right up underneath the edge of the, uh, the overhang. Maybe just get a little bit more. And I'm gonna put just a, a little bit of tape, a roll of tape or something under my board just to get a little angle to it. So that, that dark rich pigment starts to roll downhill and the water will carry that towards the bottom of the paper a little bit. So you can see that's softening a little. I might even take a tissue and just blot up a little bit in the corner. So it's not quite so defined. 
we'll let that dry for a minute and then I'll, I'll work on this tree. But for now, I just want to dry this while you're painting that. And I'm using a, a heat gun because it's quieter. It's also very hot. So uh, hopefully it will evaporate a lot of that, that wet puddle of water. I can take my brush and uh, go back in and redefine my rooftop a little bit with some raw umber which if you remember has sort of a cool greenish clay color. I'm gonna drop that in right behind this uh, chimney, just to kind of suggest that there's a, a different bit of value there. This is very warm and, and, and cold and dark, right up behind the rim of this rooftop. And then while my brush is clean, I, I rinse my brush, wipe it off, and I'm going to pull just a touch of this uh, color that's in these shapes below up onto that fascia, just a suggestion or a hint, not, not really much, just the, enough to take the white away because we don't want this to be the highest contrast in the painting. We just want to give a suggestion. I'm going to take a little bit of dark and drop this in, in a couple spots up in here just to let it soften and flow into that orange. So it gives a, a variety of patina and uh, just kind of a, there we go. Because that shape is wet, that little deposit of dryer paint just starts flowing and kind of moving within the pigment. Uh, and I can get away with that because the water is still pretty much on the surface of the paper. And uh, now I want to dry that. <coughs> so we'll just I don't know if you can see, but some of that dark that I just put in that little pinch, it's creeping up onto the fascia. Uh, some of it's creeping down the length of the, the panels on the metal roof. And it just uh, kind of looks like it's really old and weathered. And it doesn't have a real crisp edge. And we'll knock down some of those whites after this dries. But for now, I just want to get it to uh, settle down, get the pigments to kind of settle into the tooth of the paper so that it isn't sitting up on the surface. All right. Um, next next uh, order of business is going to be our tree. So we're going to start with a little bit of warmth on this side here. The sun, if you recall, the sunlight is going this way. So that means that this left or yeah, the left side of this tree is going to be a little lighter and warmer. And the, the back side, the right side of the tree, and there's a couple of trees here, are going to be cooler. But we want them to be um, more transparent, a little bit more texture, a little bit more um, lively than the darks behind the building. We want these to come forward. So there needs to be a little bit more warmth within those. Uh, that means um, I'm going to use a little bit of the, the sap green, which is a nice warm green. Um, now that I think about it, I'm going to clean my palette. See what happened? It's, it's getting kind of muddy and I want to have a really nice, fresh, clean look. So I'm going to just wipe some of that out of my palette and start with maybe a, a phthalo blue, which has a strong turquoise tint to it. A little bit of uh, viridian green moves it towards the warmer side or brighter side. Let's put it that way. It's a little bit brighter. I'm adding a little bit of water to this to make sure we've got a really nice wet mixture of that turquoise, deeper turquoise green. Now, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna leave the left side of my paint, uh, my tree, pretty much uh, white because I don't want any paint on there yet. I'm just gonna use the paint that I've already started with here. Take a, uh, a smaller brush. This is my a small round or medium sized round and just have some water on it and just pull some water down into this white negative shape side. The shape itself will read because I've already created a negative shape by putting dark behind it and that dark behind it has already dried. So I don't have to do a lot of painting on this side. I'm just dragging a little bit of this local color that's on the back side of the tree and dragging it into the front side. Now I'm going to take a little bit of uh, uh, maybe some of that, that darker blue in a couple places and just drop it in where it's wet in a few spots and then 
drop a little bit of that into this tree that's behind it. And here's where I'll put a little bit of that sap green in there. It's a, a darker, richer green. <clears throat> and then take water. And when you add water to these darker saturated colors, the, the water makes them more transparent. So they become brighter and livelier and they're just a little richer looking. And I want to add a little cobalt at this point down in the back side of this tree. And that's pretty intense, pretty saturated. So I want to add water to that. And you can see when you add water to the cobalt, it just changes it up quite a bit and cools it off. And I'm just playing with a basic shape, very wet. This is just a huge puddle of water that's rolling down towards the bottom of the paper uh, with some intense beads of, of water. There's a couple of little whites in there, but for the most part, I'm just leaving, uh, letting this whole shape get a little bit uh, wetter. And I'm going to add just a little bit of, of uh, more intense sap green, or not sap green, um, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, phthalo blue in the backside here, this, this guy up against those orange building facades, and you have a really nice, soft tree in the foreground. The other thing you can do is if you take a, a little misting bottle, I, I use, I have like five or six of these because they fail on you. The, the little mechanism inside doesn't always, isn't always reliable, but if you put a, just a very light mist down on top of this color, it lifts all that pigment up again into a, into a puddle and allows them to all flow freely from one side to the other. So the, the thalo blue, which is a highly staining blue, will start flowing into that cobalt in a few places and create the impression of texture. And we can take a little bit of warmer green, like a, a golden green or cad green light, and just drop it into these puddles. We can take a little bit of uh, Indian yellow even maybe I don't know, that might be too, that'll make for too much mud. So I'm gonna lift some of that out. But by having a roll of tape underneath your painting, all of a sudden these colors are gonna start running downhill. I always take a little tissue, blot it up and wick up the excess water that beads along the bottom. And this speeds up the, the capillary action of the water running downhill. You're, you're, it's like siphoning off gas out of a gas tank. You, uh, you, you're pulling, by, by wicking up the water on the tape, you're pulling all this other color down across that shape so it becomes very soft. And then as the water starts to kind of settle down a little bit and you can start to see the texture of the pigments dropping down into the tooth of the paper, I, I like to take a, a, a rigger, where's my rigger, and just get a little bit of water on it. And sometimes you can just flick a little bit of water into that shape and it creates texture where the water repels some of that and it just creates a beautiful uh, loose fluid mark for your, your uh, trees in the foreground. The reason I want this to be fairly soft is because this is not the center of interest, but it's a major element within the painting. So I want it to be fairly soft. I want it to be something that people just look right past. It's, it's a key element that pushes our eye towards our center of interest. But if we give it too much edge, too much detail, too much value contrast, uh, we're gonna get stuck looking at it instead of what's really important. Now I'm gonna come back in and drop a few darks on while this is still pretty wet. And this is that Prussian blue again. And I'm just gonna soften the edge of these marks and let them just kind of flow in and amongst the uh, the wet surface that we've already established. I'm going to give it a quick squirt, not much. Maybe even pick the board up a little bit and let it run from upper right to lower left. I don't know if you can see, the, the pigment is literally moving across the surface of the paper. And that is what gives you that beautiful glow. And we're going to have a nice, you know, light area at the top of the tree. And then as the tree rolls around to the backside, we start to lose the, the color into shadow, but it's all a very perceived shadow. It's nothing real defined. It's very loose. So I think that's pretty intense. 
I'm going to add a little bit of orange to this just to kind of neutralize some of that. And we've got orange. Randy, I'm sorry, I'm I'm a long way behind. Can you just talk me through the colors of the tree, please? Sure. Um, what I started with was just a very light um, phthalo blue. And when I say light, it was kind of diluted and it was um, had a lot of water in it. And I dropped that in there. And while that was a big puddle on the painting, I dropped in some, um, some cobalt colors and then a little bit of warmer colors in the CAD light down on the, on the left side, which is the light side of the tree. And you, as you have your board elevated, and mine's elevated about an inch, um, it creates an angle where gravity will pull the pigment downhill and smooth out any brush strokes. And then if you take a, a misting bottle and you just give it a real gentle you know, mist, it just takes all these pigments that you've laid down, it picks them up and creates this puddle that allows the pigments to mix back and forth within that shape. And you can literally pick up your board and angle it a little bit so you get the pigment to run diagonally across the shape or vertically across the shape. And I don't know if you can see the emerging warm bronzy color in here. What that is, is a little touch of orange that I put in there. And it looked pretty scary when I put it down. But now that it's mixed with all these wet shapes of color, it's neutralizing. It's turning to a kind of a grayed down version of itself. And it's picking up the tones that are in the building, but it's, it's not real intense. It's not what we call saturated. So you get this real soft effect of this tree shape in the foreground. It has some, some strong values, but none of it is real defined. It's, it's very soft. The shape at the top of the tree is much more defined than it is at the bottom. And the purpose is just to give us sort of a bookend or something that keeps us from going too far off to the right of the paper. And we wanna keep coming back to our center of interest, which are the series of buildings. So it's, it's, but it's, if we didn't have that, we would have kind of a, an empty photo. And if you refer back to the original photo reference, there wasn't much to it. And I, I've taken some liberties and created some things that, to make this a more interesting composition. What was the orange you used, please, um, Randy? Uh, interestingly enough, I've tried a lot of oranges and some of you may have heard this before. I, I tried different manufacturers, cadmium orange, uh, scarlet orange, different oranges, and almost all of them seemed to go dead when they dried. And so I, I just didn't use much orange. I did a workshop a couple of years ago uh, down in Sedona, Arizona. And for those of you from around the world, uh, that Sedona is known for its majestic uh, rock formations and these incredible Arizona buttes. And the orange in the rocks is so intense that it dominates everything. And the ladies in this workshop said, oh, let, let me introduce you to this, this color we use. And we said, we all use it. And I go, what color is that? And they said, it's Schmincke's transparent orange. Somebody kindly gave me a little pinch of it on my palette and I was hooked for life. Uh, I don't have any other colors in my palette by Schmincke. Uh, Schmincke is a very good brand. I think it's Dutch or Belgium, I'm not sure, but, um, it's spelled S-C-H-M-I-N-C-K-E, Schminky, and it's transparent orange. And it is absolutely the most beautiful orange I've ever used. And it stays true when it dries. It it's, keeps its vibrancy. And I really like it. Uh, there are a lot, like Daniel Smith and some of these other manufacturers have some beautiful oranges that are really more on the peachy side. This is more of an earth tone orange that's really rich and vibrant and uh, pretty staining. So it really has a nice transparency to it. And uh, hopefully you can see in the image in the doorways, how that orange, even after it dries, it stays pretty vibrant and, and glowing. Um, so hopefully that answers your question about the orange and gave some of you a chance to catch up. Part of the, the, the challenge is going to be getting these shadows underneath the trestle over on the lower left foreground and not letting them overpower the building. We wanna keep them transparent. 
We want to keep them um, shadowy feeling without completely obliterating you know, everything. And then as we emerge across the railroad tracks, I don't want to take a, a really hard, consistent line for the both of the parallel tracks. I want to keep it kind of sketchy and just sort of insinuate or suggest that there's railroad tracks there, suggest that there's some ties. So it's, it's a very painterly approach to this without being real hard edged. So knowing that, um, Keep in mind that we're going to be doing a lot of wet washes, letting water kind of flow right across shapes uh, to get this kind of uh, warmth in that part of the painting. Um, another thing that I, I tell people to remember is that warm precedes, cool recedes. So in other words, if you want something to appear that's farther away in a painting, use cools. You can use light valued cools, dark valued cools, but anything cool is going to feel farther away. And anything that becomes warmer and more vibrant uh, is going to feel closer. So it's a good catchphrase, warm precedes, cool recedes. And I think it's, uh, it's a good way to uh, remember how to bring a foreground towards the viewer and make the background recede away by using cooler colors in the background warmer, darker values in the foreground. So um, one of the things I've got to do before I tackle this lower left part of the painting is make sure my tree shape is dry. Because if I start getting wet washes over here and they hit this tree, what's going to happen? We're going to have muddy gray colors creeping into this tree. And the tree is actually looking pretty good. Uh, so I want to preserve that. And that means I've got to dry it. So I'm going to take a heat gun and dry this so that these colors set. How many of you have ever stained a blouse or a shirt and the stain set and you can't get it out? That's why we always run to the sink and we get some cold water and we try to uh, get a stain out of a white uh, cotton blouse or, or shirt right away so that the stain doesn't set. Well, guess what? In painting, it's the same way. You want your colors to set because once watercolor pigments have set in the white cotton fiber of the paper and they've completely dried, then you can paint right over it and it's a transparent medium. The next color, you'll be able to, to see layers upon layers of color. But if you try to paint over anything before it's dried, where you paint it over it just turns to mud. It turns to kind of an ugly gray. So always a good thing to, is to check with the back of your hand to see if your painting is dry enough. And when you're plain air painting, these things dry pretty quick outside unless you're in a real humid environment. But um, here in the Western United States, we're um, uh, unfortunately we have very dry climate. So we have to paint really fast. And that's why I use these little misting bottles is to re, re uh, uh, reinstall a little bit of water and wet on my paper because everything dries so fast. But uh, you definitely want your paint to have an opportunity to dry. And I'm always telling people, step back, look at your painting, look at the values, what's emerging. Um, give yourself a chance to have the painting dry before you go on to the next step. Because if you're not allowing the shapes to dry, that's where the mud comes from. And um, Unfortunately, we've all, we've all been there. It's not fun when you put a lot of work into a painting and then all of a sudden you realize, where did all the vibrancy go? The, the paint dried and now it's just really muddy. So um, just give yourself some patience, give yourself the privilege of letting you know, it dry and look at your paint. When I paint, um, I think us usually a good rule of thumb, 80% of my painting time is spent staring and thinking about the next five or six steps or brush strokes I'm going to be making. And 20% of my time is actually spent painting because um, you'll find that you want, to, you want to really be evaluating your values. You want to make sure that you're being able to see the things that need to come forward are coming forward. And the things that are receding and getting softer edged aren't too hard edged, too defined. So you can always take a, a clean brush 
and you can always go back and you can soften a shape a little bit to de-emphasize it, blend it into the background just a little bit, and you will give yourself an opportunity to see what's emerging is right or wrong. Uh, okay, so this is dry enough now. I'm going to come back in and start laying in some different colors, and I'm going to use a fairly stiff brush. I have a, a little half inch flat brush that's uh, pretty short bristled, so it remains a little bit stiffer, and I can get drier paint, and I can come in with some uh, some values. I'm going to start with some burnt, burnt sienna, sort of a cinnamon color, and I want to uh, create a little bit of shadow. And this is almost like dry brush. And I'm just basically adding, and I'm going to add a little bit of ultramarine blue to this and just get right up in some of these little pinches and work the edge of my brush. So I get a little scratchy uh, chatter of that dry paint. And I use a tissue to kind of squeeze the water out of my, my brush to make sure it's dry enough that I can take that color and just gently blend it into the different areas. And I can, using a flat, I can come right up against the shape and pretty much control what's happening. But I ended up with a nice, soft, shadowy feeling up inside where the, uh, the shadow occurs. I can always come back in and redefine a leg or a support or any particular shape. And then I dry my brush on this tissue that's in my hand and I can just soften everything so that I'm creating these transparent darks that emerge from underneath these buildings. And I can come back in and des decide, okay, this needs more definition or that needs less definition. And I can lift or I can blend as needed. And I'm constantly going back to my water. Yes. Randy, what color is that that you're using underneath there? What color? Um, either burnt sienna and ultramarine or orange and ultramarine. Either one is fine. Okay. Uh, they, they both give you kind of a neutral color, but they have a little bit of a glow to them. And I'm just going to come back in now and get uh, one of the things that I've noticed. And I talked about stepping back and evaluating your painting. This side of the painting needs to be a little bit cooler right along this edge. So I'm going to take a little bit of cobalt and not, I don't want it really bright. I want it just sort of watery, like a glaze. And I'm going to just give myself an opportunity to lay a little of this right over the top of that shadow. Clean my brush and then just use clean water to blend this right into that orange that's already there. See how that just, a, that little bit of glaze just cool that off enough that we can really feel the shadow, the coolness of that shadow shape. Uh, without it, it just got a little bit lost. It was too, too warm. Now I'm going to come back down now along these beams here and just add a little bit of crevices in a couple spots. And it, it suggests that there's structure without actually having to do much. Uh, I'm going to get maybe a little bit of burnt sienna and uh, some of that ultramarine blue and create a little bit darker. Um, and I also mentioned before that I was going to take a, a little bit of cool color on my brush, and this is pretty wet, and just put a little bit of coolness down on the edge of this, this chute so that it uh, has a little bit of shadow to it. Come back down along this edge of the building doorway, get some dark in there as well. It just pushes things back. Um, I'm gonna come now on this side where the trestle is, and I wanna put a few little shadow shapes that come down, they go to the ground, and then the shadow is gonna come, come across horizontally across the, the ground surface from the cast shadow of this trestle. But for now, I just wanted to get a little bit of warmth up underneath in, in this shadow shape. I just added a little bit of orange to that and I'm just gonna soften that with a little bit of water. So it just sort of suggests that there's a bit of shadow underneath there. Pull that over just so it's all kind of like that. All right, now going back to my stiffer half inch brush, let's go back in and get underneath this building, just add a little bit of dark. Uh, this, this 
just, just a little suggestion that there's some structure holding this uh, this building up. Can you and review where the shadows are warm and where they're cool, please, Randy? Uh, repeat that again. Can you review where the shadows are warm and where they are cool? Sure. Um, where I'm going to use this example right up here. Where the overhang is casting a shadow on this sunlit surface, the bottom edge of that cast shadow is going to be pretty cool. This is a form shadow over here because the light can't come around here and cast anything. It's all in form shadow. But where the light can't bend around the corner, that's where it's going to be coolest. But as you proceed towards the back end of that surface that's in shadow, you're going to get bounced light, reflected light. And that's going to warm up the back surface of that building. So anytime you have shadows, you want to have part of the shadow that's closest to the light source, going to be cooler and darker. And then as, as the shadow moves away across the surface from the light source, you're, you're going to get more ambient light bouncing back into that surface. And it's going to be warmer. Now, if you took a photograph, a camera is a mechanical object. It, it's not going to capture anything too suggestive. It's going to just capture everything exactly as it sees it. As artists, we want to exaggerate. We want to create the perception to the viewer of what they're looking at. And in order to do that, we have to take some liberties. We have to do a little bit of exaggerating in places. And this is our opportunity to make a shadow shape much more painterly, much more entertaining, a lot more fun to look at. So. Uh, as I get down in beneath this building here, we're going to get some ambient light back on the backside. So I'm going to take a, a damp brush and just drop a little bit of water back into the backside so that the backside of that starts to get a little lighter in value. And I also want to get a little warmer as we start moving into the railroad tie areas closer to the, um, the you know, this is all in shadow down here, but it's a warm shadow which makes it come alive and it's closer to the viewer. So I'm just dropping in a little bit of orange. I'll drop in a little bit of red here and there, uh, but we're just gonna create kind of an interesting series of colors. And I'm just constantly rinsing my brush and picking up different versions of, of warm colors. Some are gonna be cad red or pyro red. Some are going to be orange. Some might be a little bit purple. Uh, here's a little bit of uh, uh, warm violet. Let's see what happens here when we do that. We just drop a little bit of this in here and there. And the net effect, once everything starts blending together, is that we have these beautiful little uh, movements of, of light going through our surfaces that you may not really see in nature, but it certainly feels natural. I'm going to get some more oranges now in here, and we'll just start dropping some of this into these wet shapes. These are all very wet now. And I'm bringing a little bit of darker value right up to the backside in a couple of places of my railroad track. And I want to make sure that I keep that fairly straight <clears throat> and dark, darker in a couple of spots, just so that we, we see variety in our edge across there. I think most of you who have been painting a while, you've heard the expression, anywhere you have an uninterrupted straight edge, the viewer is going to be drawn to that immediately. So if we have a railroad track that's not in our center of interest and it's a straight hard line, people are gonna look at that instead of your buildings. What we really wanna do is have a variety of, of shapes and colors coming across this, this ground surface here. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of uh, raw umber and I've got some uh, trestles over here on the far side. So I'm gonna just drop in shadow behind some of these structures to give the impression that there is um, structure there without having to actually paint it. Now I'll just drop in some water and soften those, some of those shapes up a little bit. But now you can actually see where those edges occur and without having to actually do a whole lot of work, you know, in painting around all these. I'm just doing it in a few little places here and there. I'm taking water, softening these shapes, 
and just working my way through a little bit of structure and it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just sort of a suggestion of where the, all this structure is. And you can come back in with uh, deeper, richer colors, darker colors. Maybe you've got some boxes or barrels or something back in there. Who knows what they are? It doesn't matter because they're just a little bit darker and there's shadows going across them and it's all wet and flowing and fluid and very watercolor-ish. Uh, I mean, you, you really, and look, I'm getting a big bloom right there. It's absolutely gorgeous. You, you know, you can't always plan for those, but when you get them, don't eliminate them, use them and embrace them because that's, that's the money shot. You want to always look for the opportunity to, uh, to drop water in next to really rich color and see what, what happens. Maybe you get something that will just literally uh, bloom and blend and start getting really rich texture. Um, you don't always know what it's going to do, but when it happens, leave it and, and, and make it part of your painting. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm getting a little darker in value as I come to the lower right corner or lower left corner because this is closer to the viewer and I want this to be uh, what we look at. I'm going to get a little bit more violet in here just to kind of change this up a little bit. Add a little bit of light blue, maybe a little cerulean blue in a couple of spots just to vary it. But you can see it's a, it's a series of little brush strokes of different colors. And if I kept the same color on my brush and just added color, it would be muddy, but I'm rinsing between each color and going back and forth to my palette so that I can really get some variety in here. I'm going to uh, maybe drop in a little bit of water in a couple spots here and see if we can't carry some of this color right across and uh, create the illusion of maybe these are some shadowy shapes that are moving across the, the, the railroad track. Drop in a little darker along the edge of, of part of these tracks where it's a little bit cooler in shadow. And then pick up a little bit of raw sienna and just maybe get some warmer shapes as they come closer to the viewer. And I want to uh, come back in now and add a little bit of water in here so that when this dries, this is all very soft and kind of all these colors flow together to create a really beautiful um, combination. But I'm, I'm gonna soften these marks that are in between the tracks and then continue to add a variety of colors. I'm gonna add a little bit of green in here, why not? Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, turquoise, a couple of places. Uh, these are all colors that we've already used within the painting in one version or another. So why not incorporate them right into these really loose foregrounds that are very fluid and wet and all this water and color just grabs a hold. And I'm just leaving a few little tickles of white for the railroad tracks, not much. I just want a little bit of it to be uh, visible in a couple spots and you'll connect the dots. The viewer will be able to see that there's things happening there that suggest there's railroad tracks. And once this dries, I'll come back in and put a few suggestions of the actual railroad ties that are emerging up out of this uh, um, foreground. Um, this is starting to dry back here. So I gotta go back and soften these marks up with some other colors just to make sure that they don't dry too fast and then preserve my edge work. My hand got shaky there, so we just lost it. There we go. Um, and then just kind of get a little cooler up against this warm tree. And I can create an edge for the tree just by dropping in some cooler color. And I'm going to get just a touch darker uh, cerulean blue, clean my brush, soften that away, wick some of this up. But you see how just dropping that little glaze of, of lighter blue against the warmer edge of the tree, we're able to give a suggestion of the shape of that tree. Um, I'm going to get a little glazing going on in the back there, but I've got to get my shadows underneath this trestle once this all dries. But before that happens, it's time to take a, a brush and just sprinkle a little bit of water 
into this big wet shape beneath the trestle. And you're gonna get all kinds of texture in the ground where the water starts repelling some of the paint and giving you texture. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it's, it's starting to, to really create a lot of variety within that without any hard edges. And the only hard edges we've got so far are just a suggestion of these trestles. And I'm gonna come back in and punch those up a little bit with some darks, but we gotta let this dry. So I'm gonna let you paint, have fun with this and just try to use as, you know, three or four colors and go back and forth with every brush stroke, cleaning your brush in between and drop water with those colors in it and let them all mingle together. And you'll get this really nice, rich uh, mingling of color. And it, uh, it'll look really sharp. We're gonna come back in and put some, just a suggestion of a few of the railroad ties beneath this, but we have to let this dry first. And, uh, Give yourself an opportunity for it to dry. Look at it, size it up. Is it all working? You know, make sure that you're happy with it. And uh, if you've got a hair dryer, you're on mute. Go ahead and dry it uh, so that you you get the advantage of being ready to go for the next step. Um, I bought this. Uh, I had a couple of heat guns that were, you know, the size of my hair dryer, which is a real small one. Uh, and I burned them out over a course of about three years. So I went to order another one. And Amazon, which is a big company here in America, um, delivered the same one that I had the next day. So they must have had them in their distribution center here in Denver. And I opened it. I was all excited. I said, oh, great. I can keep working. And the plug on it was for the UK. And they don't have any adapters here for American plugs for the UK. And I'm like, why did they send this? So I had to go find another one. I found this at uh, one of the hardware outlets and it's a much bigger than I wanted and a lot hotter than I want. But the idea is with a heat gun, I, I can use something that's quiet and still uh, talk while I'm drying. So I have a question uh, got, though, that uh, in your finished painting, there were some negative trees. How did you get them? Um, I came back in because this is warm and light in value on the left side of the tree and it was already dry. I came in with a, a glaze, a very diluted mixture of cerulean blue and just kind of cut in around the tree to give it the shape. Is that, it, it sounds simplistic, but it is. It's, it's, yeah. you know, I didn't have a lot of color or value down in this part of the, the, the center of the Foreground. She went to the left of the buildings. There were some negative trees there. Left right here? Yeah. That and was my uh, Prussian blue with a little burn umber, or raw umber. Sorry, raw umber and Prussian blue. It gives it that really deep, dark forest uh, green color that's uh, a little cooler, like off in the distance instead of real close to you. So while we're waiting for this to dry, Sorry, I think she meant there were some negative trees in the in the practice painting that you did on the left hand oh, I side. To, I forgot to scrape those out. Oh, fine, fine. And it's too dry now to do that. Yeah, okay. Sometimes you can take the back end of your brush handle if you've got a sharp bevel on it, and you can scrape it while it's wet. And I was busy talking, and I forgot to do that. So um, that's a nice little element that you can do occasionally to uh, create some interest. Get a little sparkle going. Um, I'm going to mix a little bit of the uh, sap green with cerulean blue and see if I can't add just a few more trees off here in the middle distance, a little bit more cerulean in, in, instead of green, and then add a little bit of raw umber to the bottom of that to warm it up. And this is just going to pull in against the edge of my um, chimney to create just a little bit of dark there and then soften that away with water. So you just sort of have a, a little definition there. Maybe have just a touch of, of raw umber on the back side as well, just to continue it down. But it just gives you one more layer of uh, interest. Maybe a Something right in there. But that little bit of dark up against that chimney helps define that chimney just a little bit. And I'm doing this because I, 
want to move away from my foreground and do something while we're talking. But that it's uh, this is sort of the nature of painting. You have to keep moving around in your painting, give, give certain areas time to, to dry, settle down, and become uh, good. This is still really pretty wet. Uh, and if I tried to paint into this too much, it's going to get really nasty and, and muddy unless I take a really dry amount of paint. And I might just do this to show you what we can do with some burnt umber, a little bit of ultramarine blue. Um, I've got, I'm, I'm mixing up just a little bit of uh, dry pigment here with some cerulean blue and burnt umber. And I'm going to come back in and start the shadow. I'm not going to finish it, but I'm just going to put a little start of the shadow edge down in this part where we've got some things underneath this trestle. And then I'm going to clean my brush, get all the, the uh, paint off of it, kind of dry it, and soften the back edge of these shadow shapes for my trestle. And you can see how it just gives a very soft suggestion of shadow without having to actually give really hard edge shadows in there. And it just disappears into the background. I can pick up a little bit more paint here or there and put a few marks that are just slightly darker. Come back in underneath this uh, building shape over here and just define that leg of the building just with a little bit of shadow. Right behind the trestles here, I'll just put a little darker uh, color. It's, it's ultramarine more or less. But, but it just sort of suggests... Would you revisit that color mix, please? Uh, again, it's, it's orange and ultramarine. And it, but it was very dry, very little water. And the reason I use very little water is the paper's already wet. So if I had a wet brush stroke on top of this damp paper, it's going to instantly turn to mud. But if I can use a really dry, oily consistency of a dark pigment on my brush and then touch it to this damp paper, It'll soften that mark, but it won't, it, it won't turn into a bloom. It won't turn into a mud. It'll just be a nice, rich dark across here. And that's all I'm trying to do is create the impression of these loose shadows that are on the ground beneath the trestle. And I can even pick up a little bit of it, make it lighter as it goes back. Um, and we had some of this coming down the side of this uh, building underneath that trestle. I'm going to get that a little darker. It's dried light. So sometimes you have to go back and add drier, darker value right underneath this trestle. And I'm going to uh, clean my brush, get all the water off of it, and soften the back edge of that so the dark is right up along the leading edge of the cast shadow. And I'm going to take some of that same paint and push it right up at an angle to that edge. And then I'll just pull some of this across there. And then I'll take that same burnt umber, ultramarine blue, pretty dark, but fairly dry. And I wanna get just a hint of darks in between some of these, uh, these little ties. So we just have a suggestion of some darks in there. They don't have to be perfect. They're just sort of a, a very light suggestion of shadows in between the ties. And I'm just gonna take a little bit of water and soften some of the edges of that, let them lead down into the, uh, the darks beneath. And I think that's all we need to do with that. Um, we can always take a little bit of the, the raw umber and some green and maybe define that's too dark. So we'll just clean our brush and lift that right out of there. But I'm just going back and reinforcing in a couple of places the edge work of these trestles. And then just take this stiffer brush and feather that, that mark away from the edge. And you, even though some of it's been painted across, that's okay. It's like there's another bit of shadow going across some of these trestles. And you can just really reestablish an edge in your brush, soften the bottom edge that just blend it into the rest of the, uh, the background. And all of a sudden you've crisped up your, your timbers that are supporting this. 
I'm gonna come back in here with a little bit of darks in a couple places, clean my brush, and just soften the back edge of those. All of a sudden now we've, we're done. We've got these uh, the shadow shapes pretty well set. I'm gonna come back in now with a, just the, the sharp edge of this half inch uh, flat, add some drier paint. So I've got some nice rich color darks. And I want to just drop a few of these in here to suggest that there's crevices and cracks within the structure. They go back into the shadow shapes. And it just says, oh yeah, there's uh, quite a structure to this thing. And if I reinforce this in a couple places, it almost looks like there's um, maybe a cross beam going through there. Get all the color off my brush. Just create sort of a a little bit of a shadow there. And um, I can come back in down below and create a little darker there. Maybe there's some vegetation or something back in there that's creating this dark. But again, I'm just gonna take my, my clean damp brush and just soften that and, and so I don't really have any hard edges. I'm gonna leave that alone. Now I've got some, um, Railroad tracks that I want to put, or what do you call it? The uh, railroad ties. They're supporting the rails. I've got to make sure this is fairly dry. So I'm going to give it a pretty hard shot of heat. And we'll let the, uh, the pigment on the paper dry. And then come back in on top of that with some cooler colors. Maybe a little bit of cerulean blue, um, just a hint of green in a few places, but this is almost just a barely perceptible uh, shadow shapes in a couple spots and, and they don't have to be perfect. You can have uh, a series of these that are different sizes, but keep them kind of all moving in coordination with the vanishing point if you can. Um, and even if you can come back into your rail in a couple of spots with a, a darker value, a darker uh, shadow shape, maybe get some blues in there in a few spots, maybe some of those blues come across and you've got a few of these little uh, suggestions of railroad ties without being too obvious. Just that little bit of texture on there is about all you need. Um, come back in with a little bit of warm and drop over the top of that. Now we're going to take that same dark that we used for these crevices and I'm going to come back in underneath this little section in the building that's casting a shadow. I want to uh, take a little bit of orange and a little bit of cerulean blue and maybe suggest a few little shapes within between the battens on the side of this building. So you and you just take some water and soften it in a few places, maybe take a little bit of red, add to that so you've got some warmth in there. And it just sort of reinforces the fact that there's some, some siding on the side of this building. You can do the same over here. Just add little bits of it here and there. Nothing too obvious. Uh, just a little bit of cerulean blue, maybe. Take a, a little bit of damp, clean brush and just soften some of these down into the, the surface and maybe come back over this with just a few little suggestions of shape in there. I'm gonna get a little bit darker back in here. Can you say something about your brushes? Um, these, these are uh, kind of an acrylic handle. You can buy acrylic handle brushes in most art supply stores now. They have a, a nice sharp bevel on the back end of them. And I like these because I can scrape out things if I need to use it as an additional tool. Um, the other thing is people tend to leave their brushes in water. And when they leave their brushes in water with a wood handle, it wicks up that water through the bristle into the ferrule. The wood expands, it breaks the seal of the glue. And then as the wood dries later, it shrinks back. And pretty soon your ferrule is really loose and you have to tape it up and get it to firm it up again. These don't do that. I don't know why, but um, it's something the way they're made, the fact that it's acrylic instead of wood. What's but, the brand, uh, please, uh, Randy? Either by Sterling Edwards. I buy them either through his website, Sterling Edwards Fine Art, uh, or um, Jerry's Artorama here in the United States. Uh, he has these made for him in China. I also use 
some um, Escoda brushes. I, I use a, my mop brushes or Escodas. Um, I, I'm not, I use these primarily outdoors when I'm plain air painting. Uh, I love this Da Vinci spin brush. It's a, it's a number 40 Da Vinci. It's made in Germany, but they sell them at most of the online places. And uh, when I get it wet, the edge on this is just remarkably crisp. And I can get a, a real sharp point, or I can use the broad edge of it to lay down a big wash. And the handle's real easy to hold. Uh, and I've ended up buying about three or four of these over the years now. They, but you can see what happens. They, because they're short, and I use a fairly, I don't know if you can see my, my uh, water canisters there. My water gets dirty. And these things get lost in the water sometimes, unfortunately. And uh, I'll be looking and looking and looking for my brush and it's like down in the bottom of there. And so consequently the paint starts peeling off and uh, they get worn out pretty quick, but um, I love them. They're really nice. And, uh, but I do use a lot of the Escoda brushes and I use the Sterling Edwards brushes. So all of those, each has a tool of its own that's uh, important. Your painting is um, swiveled round. Yeah, I use a couple of different brands. And, you know, it's like you got to have the right tool for the right job, and I use all of them. Now, let's take a look at these vertical chimneys. Can you We've turn had... your painting 90 degrees, please, or, or the, your camera, rather? Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes they, these phones jump. I'm using my iPhone. So it, it's a pretty good tool. Um, I, I, I'm going to add a few little shadows on the back side of the... Uh, of these trestles just to suggest where the uh, the shape is against these these negative shapes behind it. Uh, get a little cooler uh, over on this side. So we start to see that there's maybe a little bit of shadow underneath here and then get underneath there with some more shadow. And then we've got a very light background with these mountains and we have these negative shapes of the of the smokestacks going upward, kind of giving it some vertical thrust at an oblique angle, which adds tension to a painting. So what I like to do is what we call alteration. Alteration is where you take a dark color and you put it on a shape where it's got a light background behind it. And I can add some kind of interesting color here, maybe a little bit of orange with that cool blue. And then as it comes down, into these lighter, darker areas behind it, I'll let it remain a, a negative shape. I'm going to add a little bit of cool blue to this on the backside. So we start to see, let's see if I can use a smaller round to get this filled in. Uh, I want to try to get um, something that really has some vertical thrust to it. And this one's behind there. So I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of value at this edge here, clean my brush and just get that to soften away to nothing. The ones that are closer to us, I'm going to use some, some warmer colors and come across some of these shapes and then leave the one behind it with barely any tone on it at all. But I want to just connect some of these, these values and just lighten them up a little bit. So there's a variety of, of values within the, uh, the vertical shape. Maybe add a little bit more orange in a couple spots to warm it up. So you really start to feel some dynamic shape. And I'm going to add a little bit of cobalt to the top of this, this guy and then introduce some orange. And I'm, I'm working, believe it or not, with a fairly limited palette. I'm, I'm using a lot of the same colors throughout, but in varying degrees of value. And what this does is it unifies everything. And as, as this comes down across these midtones, it gets lighter and lighter until we have a dark background behind it. And I'll leave that very light and then I'll pick up some of these um, darker values again as it crosses over a background that's, that's light in value. And then I'll just take water and drag it through there just to make it soft. And then add a really nice crisp dark in a couple of spots here, just to really define the directionality of these. And I think that's about all. And you can see I've got to use a lot of water to kind of spread this, this intense value out 
so that it doesn't uh, get too glommed up in one spot. We want to have a variety of colors in there. But that gives a, a nice, rich little uh, variety within that shape of the smokestacks going across these negative shapes. Could you recap what you said about alteration? Um, yeah, when you have a, uh, a dark background, a negative shape shows up much better against a dark background. But if that dark background, I mean, if that, that negative shape pokes up into a really uh, light background, then you want to try to introduce some really subtle, you know, colors. And in this case, I'm going to bring a little bit of color down, clean my brush, and just take some of that and just make it a little bit of warmth on there. So we start to feel like it's, uh, there's some, some tone to it without taking away from the fact that it's a negative shape. And I'm going to add just a touch of variety to that, that surface to warm it up where it's against a really light background. And then down here, maybe I've got some shapes that I just dragged a little bit of water into, leave it alone. So just that little bit of value against those, uh, the, the white mountains behind it pulls that forward. It's still a negative shape, but it has just a hint of, of uh, texture and tone. If I tried to paint every piece of siding on there, it'd be too busy. But this, this just kind of defines it a little bit. I'm going to take some pink and some orange and create a sort of a rust color, but it's got to be pretty wet. And I'm just going to create a little bit of uh, directionality with this rooftop here, just to create a little bit of tone because it's behind these guys and it doesn't need to be quite as Maybe I add a little green. There we go. But these are the subtle things that you add to a painting to just kind of push it back a little bit behind this other shape. We've got a sliding door here. So I'm going to take some just some junk paint in my palette and just create a little bit of a shadow behind this door to suggest that it's uh, sitting out away from the surface of that building just maybe an inch. And it just is, it creates kind of a nice suggestion of uh, shape. And we'll get a little bit of this darker blue. I'm going to drop it in behind this eave, right behind this door a little bit. Just pulls that forward. All right, now um, let's go back to our railroad tracks. I'm just taking more junk paint in my palette. And I'm just going to just take the edge of my brush. And in a couple of spots, I'm just going to drop in some darker spots of color value, nothing real defined, just a real light kind of suggestion of a, of a, a little bit of a edge there where there might be the, the railroad ties. If you get too suggestive, too defined, it takes our attention away from what we want. I'm going to come in in a couple places underneath this, uh, these, these uh, trestles and create a little bit of uh, value really mid-tones, just to kind of do punch them up and push the background behind it. A uh, little bit of uh, cerulean blue, very, very pale, just to push that part of the building back just a little bit. And I think that uh, that works pretty well. Now, let's go over here to the other side of the building, the, uh, the little roof over here. We have these big white bats on the, uh, the battens on the roof. I want to take my, my uh, flat, it's wet, and I'm going to get just a little bit of junk on my palette, I mean on my brush, and just drag it across those so they're not quite so bright. Everything's dry. I'm, I can glaze across this without moving or altering any of the color that I put down there before, but I'm just knocking down the intensity of the whites. The, the chimney itself, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take a little bit of this, uh, uh, just a, some of this very pale kind of warm color and just throw a little bit on there because I don't really feel like I need to uh, push this too hard. I'm going to put the back side of this chimney a little darker up against that mid-tone background. 
come in behind it a little bit and then get a little bit darker right up in that area. Clean my brush, get all that dark color off and just let that flow into this shape in front of the chimney. Using my small brush and some of the same dark color that's in my palette, I'm gonna come in underneath this little chimney structure, clean my brush and just drag a little of that down the side, down the back side, and then picking up just some a mixture of the Prussian blue and the burnt sienna, I'm gonna create just a, a little nonsensical mark there that's a shadow. It doesn't have to have any form. Drop a little bit of cool into it. Soften it. And that's about all you need to do with that. Now, um, let's, we talked a little bit about cleaning some things up. I want to clean up a little bit of this before I put a shadow on it. So I'm going to show you I don't know if everybody's ready for this, but you can watch. I'm going to take a piece of masking tape, and this is, I think, three, three quarters wide, not very wide. Pull off a little bit of it. Take my jeans and, and put a little bit of it on there. And I want to get this support kind of crisped up. I'm going to take a, a knife and use some of the same masking tape, put it on the other side, take a little bit and put on the end of that structure and a little bit down on the other end of the structure. So now I've literally masked, I don't press that tape down too hard everywhere except around the edges of the, the shape that I wanna retrieve. I'm gonna take my um, magic eraser, cut off a little piece of it, and then just put it in water and squeeze every bit of the water out. The other thing you need to remember to do, my, my hands are wet, so I'm going to dry them on my pant leg. And I'm just going to now very gently stroke that little shape. And when you peel the tape back carefully, and this is why you want the paint, paint to be totally dry, we've now lifted all the paint and created a nice crisp shape that has that white support. I'm going to put a little shadow on part of that, so part of that sticking up white through the doorway and into the side of the building. Uh, I can do the same thing with this little smokestack. I've got a little bit of ragged edge here and I want that edge to be a little brighter. So I'll just put a little of this on here and leave just a tickle of, of white and come in with my, my magic eraser, squeeze all the water out of it and just Literally just take about two or three little passes with that thing, peel back the tape, and I've kind of crisped it up. Now I don't need to do a lot of this, but every once in a while you'll get a little thing that looks kind of out of place. We've got this the side of this uh, little chute that I kind of painted up over. So I'm going to clean up this. Just put a couple pieces down like this, and all I want to do is just get rid of those little brown mid-tone marks and then I'll dry everything because if I don't dry this and I go back to try to crisp up an edge it'll all bleed into that area where the wet sponge was. Where else did I do it? So taking a small round I can now come back onto that shoot with a cooler cobalt blue and really put a little, little more contrast up against where the sun is shining on the edge of that. You see how that just pulls that out and makes it much more visible? And I'm gonna take a little bit and, and get the bottom edge of this as well. So that, that helped that. We've got this strut that comes across here. I'm gonna create a shadow where the, the sunlight is casting a bit of a shadow across there like that. And we'll just, drag some of that blue right up into the shadow so it all matches. And uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of the green and just put a little tip on that upper edge. Those are the little things that, that finish a painting that really kind of make it all come together. This is part of the overhang of the eave. We'll get that a little, little crisped up, evened up, soften that away. 
And uh, I think we're in good shape there. Now let's get behind this smokestack with just a little bit more edge to show where that roof line is on that far building. Take some water and soften that. Now that's poking behind there quite a bit now. We feel like it's behind. Maybe we've got some darks that come down behind um, the trestles that are part of that smokestack series. We don't know where they go. Doesn't matter where they go. It just we just need to have a continuity of that shape going behind the trestles. And I'm going to take water and lift a little bit of that intensity so we don't see all that. And then I'm going to lift a little of that through there just to say that there's a, a beam that's going across. We've got another beam that's going across here. I'm just going to put something down like that. Now, let's take a rigger. I think some of you have heard me using a rigger before. And I'm going to put a few little touches in here just to kind of clean a few things up. Uh, these are the, this is the very end of the painting where you do the final trim out. This, this little smokestack that's sitting up in the air, it, it's not going to show up unless it has a little bit of a shadow to it. So we'll put that on there. We'll put a little bit under, under, underneath there. Uh, the edge of this guy needs to have a little bit of definition. Um, I like, where else do we need? We were going to put some um, lines in here that are supporting these chimneys. And uh, maybe we come in underneath here with a little bit of a edge for that support. And I don't think we really need a whole lot more to this. So this is, you know, knowing when to quit is half the battle. So you've got to come back in and just add a few darks here and there with the edge of your, your uh, rigger just to suggest where the shadows might be. But now we don't have a, you know, there's definitely a line here for the railroad tracks, but it's interrupted continuously with lost edges. And there's dark values, light values, warm values, cool values, but all of that feels more natural than if you had a continuous line that would draw our attention away. We can always come back in with some darks and punch up a few of these little shadows in the trestles. But for, for my intents and purposes, I think we're probably in uh, good shape we can always put in a few more of these little siding marks if that suits you. Um, just little things to add to the structure. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is maybe cast a little bit of a cooler shadow on this side of the building. I'm going to just take some of this warm color with some cerulean blue and maybe just drop a little of this in here that says, yeah, there's a little bit of a tree shadow across these structure and then get a little cooler and just add water. So it's almost like a little bit of a shadow shape in there. Put a little dark within that water and pick some of it up so it isn't quite so intense. And now you've got a shadow from these trees being cast. So all of those things work together if we're step, stepping back a little bit and, and looking at this kind of objectively, maybe we need to come back in and put a little bit more, you know, something in these mountains areas back in here that's a middle ground that builds up towards this building shape. And this is again where you go back in and you do a lot of evaluation. You have to just step back away from your painting and say, what does it need? Do I need a little more value? Do I need less value? Do I need to pick up paint or drop more paint down? And just softening these edges and, and creating a little bit more cool value around this ch uh, chimney will help us see this as closer to us and make the mountains feel farther away. So I'm just blending in, dropping in value, maybe a little bit of ultramarine. That's too dark. So we'll just drop in a little bit in this middle ground in here. And we haven't really heard anything, but we've, we've pulled the foreground forward by just dropping in these cool values and glazes into the background. And it, it more or less reinforces the mountains as well. 
So I think that that's probably where we want to be with that. Now, the, the tree is pretty dry, um, but we want to make sure everything is completely dry before we put any more rigor work on here. So I'm going to take a, an opportunity to use a heat gun to just hit these things a little bit with uh, some dry action so I don't get anything muddy. And I want to get a couple of things glazed in here that just crisps up a couple of these edges a little bit. There. Sometimes if you just take a brush and just bring a little bit of dark right up to an edge, that reinforces where it is. And you don't need to do much more than that. All right, now let's, uh, do we need anything on this roof? We've lost that roof line and we don't really see it. So I'm gonna get some rust, a little bit of orange, a little bit of uh, whatever I have here in my palette, sort of a dirty orange, but very pale, very diluted. And I want to uh, just come across the top edge of that roof line with a bead of water and then pull it down along the, the directionality that the, uh, the roof structure would be. Pick up a little bit more red in that roof and drop it into that wet shape and then just soften that. So we really don't see any brush dark. We just feel that tone of warmth across the top of that roof line. But that holds that roof line up above the, uh, in front of the snow in the background on those far mountains. And it just creates a nice, corner for that that uh, roof to be in okay i don't think we really need it up above we could put a little bit in but not much I, I like it just to keep it as a a little bit of tone in there behind that smokestack there just sort of defines that shape coming forward a little bit um, we can take a rigger and put some warm color on it and just put a few little marks on. I had some horizontal lines on here, which I don't really want. So I'm going to erase them because I've already got vertical siding on this side. I'm going to do the same here. I'll just put a few little marks that su suggest that there's siding on that sunlit surface. Maybe we've got a cross structure or something on that door. Now, we've used a lot of orange and reds in this. So I'm gonna use an orange and a burnt sienna so I get a dark enough value. And I'm gonna use my rigor to come in here. And I've got a kind of a quiet area here. So I wanna make sure I don't have too much paint coming off this. And I'm just gonna sign my painting right in here. But this color is, in, is compatible with the rest of the painting. So we want to always try to um, maintain the same colors so that they're not competing with what else is going on in your painting. Uh, but I think that this is a pretty, pretty much a finished painting at this point. What I always recommend people do is put this up on a, a, a shelf or a you know, desktop or something so you can stare at it for a couple of days. And you'll immediately see things within the next three, four or five hours as things start to dry um, that might need an adjustment. Give yourself that opportunity. Allow yourself to uh, stare at your painting, look at the value changes. Is everything reading appropriately? Does something need to be darker? Uh, do you need to go back and do a, fun, you know, a little finishing touch? But if you keep picking at it at this point, you're going to overwork it. So it's better to leave it alone, step away from the painting, let it dry, look at it, evaluate it, and decide 
is this, am I happy with this? Do I need to do anything else or is it done? And it, it's better to, uh, to make that decision later than tell yourself 10 minutes ago, it was a great pain. Because <laughs> if we overwork it, sometimes we, we sabotage our own work. So always give yourself that opportunity. Uh, if you decide you need a few darks here or there, you can always go back in and put them in, but uh, it's, it's easier to do it later than overwork something.